<clears throat> what we'll be talking about today. So I'll be talking a bit about the, the science behind this. Um, so this is part of my own personal um, research background on Titanobo and the amazing world right after the age of the dinosaurs. Um, we're going to give you, um, Greg is uh, going to give you a, a full rundown on how he created the snake that you'll see slithering around here. There's another one kind of camped out not too far away. Um, he spent a lot of time putting these things together. Um, and Julia uh, will be rounding up with um, all the work she did putting into the environments um, that we're now immersed in. So we're trying to recreate um, the world of Titanoboa. One second. Someone doesn't have a voice. Um, but hopefully you guys are getting connected in. <coughs> Okay, next. All right, the science. Uh, so, um, and I apologize if some of you guys might have seen my uh, presentation on Titanobo before, you'll definitely uh, see some stuff from that. Um, but it's been a long time, so maybe we could all use a little, little bit of a refresher anyway. Um, so one of the things I find so fascinating about reptiles in particular, and this is really my, my specialty within paleontology, is the ancient life of reptiles. Um, and that is, uh, a large part of that is just because they are quote-unquote cold-blooded, they're ectothermic, meaning that they need a certain amount of their temperature from their surrounding environment to function in a, in a much more fundamental way than you see in warm-blooded animals like mammals. And as a result, their um, evolution gets tied in a lot more intimately with uh, changes of climate. And you can see that reflected really well in things like body size. You get really large body sizes in the warmest parts of <coughs> the Earth. Um, and that's really well typified by things like uh, anacondas in northern South America, or sh <coughs> excuse me, shown here, reticulated python in Southeast Asia. Um, and the largest lizards, uh, um, the Komodo dragon in Indonesia, and the, the warmest, hottest parts um, <coughs> of the world is where you're going to get the, the most extremes of body size, where you, or the, the biggest body size possible. Um, that's because it's just uh, physiologically uh, capable of, of working in a, a much colder climate. Than that. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we've got a, a ride function on the big snake. I think that'll be a next step. But uh, it's it's looking really good. And there's a, he built it from the ground up too, so you'll, you'll hear all about all the nitty gritty there. Um, let me see if I can pull up my slides locally here and, and see what we're talking about. That's right, it is a constrictor snake. Um, so it is not venomous, but it is definitely incredibly powerful. We'll get in a little bit of the specifics of that if I can just. Sorry, I apologize. For me, I'm just seeing a blurry screen. Hopefully, you guys are seeing an actual screen with the read stuff. <laughs> I'm pulling up my own stuff here so I can see where we are in, the, in this and um, get back up to speed. Sorry. Um, Come on. Um, oh, uh, thank you. And someone said we're on a Paley scene. Okay, all right. Well, I got my slides up here. Okay, so Paley scene. Sorry, thank you. Um, so we're going to walk back to this, this time here. Um, we're about uh, 60 million years ago, um, and this is 
um, part of Northern and South America that was really unknown um, to science until we um, were able to get into um, the Serifon coal mine. Um, so this is a time when temperatures were, were much higher than they are today, even with kind of the, the projected changes that we're looking at in the near future. Um, so when we're um, getting into this, so this is the Serifon coal mine, basically it's a, it's a large open pit coal mine and it's only because of that that we're actually able to see any of this rock layer at all. It would normally be way around. Um, so basically as they're excavating out coal, we've been able to go in and see what we can find. And uh, we found pretty early on um, bones of crocodilians. <coughs> this actually became my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, so what you're seeing on the left there is a uh, spinal column or part of it of a crocodile. So we've got uh, a few vertebrae in a row there. Um, uh, then in the bottom right there, this is uh, one of the skulls that I found on, on one of my longer stints there, um, which is just awesome. Um, to kind of boil down a, a ton of work into one slide effectively. Um, <clears throat> the diversity um, for the crocodile forms was uh, three, do, three new species, uh, which I got to name, um, living in a, a pretty riverine environment, but very, very flooded, um, which is basically what we're standing in right now. So lots and lots of water, lots and lots of vegetation. Um, and uh, in that, you're not only getting these uh, crocodile forms that have a variety of sizes, some of which got to be quite big. Um, you're also getting some really big turtles. Um, we do have a couple of fish that have been found from here as well. Um, so you'll see just by the screen here, there's uh, a lungfish. Um, there, haven't, no one's created a lungfish in Second Life yet, so we've got an kind of illustration here to at least kind of convey that a bit. Um, and you'll see some um, crocodilian and turtles around the landscape here. These were all um, selected because we're at least pretty similar to things that were alive at the same time and scaled out to about the right size. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about the crocodilians there is that they um, have, <laughs> one of them in particular, Anthracosuchus, had an incredibly powerful bite. And we see lots and lots of tooth marks from this um, croc along the shells of even the really, really, really big turtles there. Like um, the one next to the, the guy there, that's Edwin, who worked on the turtles from the site. He is about probably five foot six, something like that, to give you a little bit of a sense of scale there. Um, and you're getting bite marks all the way in the middle of the, the shell there, which gives you a sense of not only how big these things were, but how powerful it was because the, you lose force as you go further into, um, like further away from the, the back of the jaw, so that means that you have a lot of force if you're leaving mark in solid bone that far back, or that far into a shell. Um, now, what you're looking at here is actually the first uh, snake vertebra, as far as I can tell, that was recovered um, from the site. And you get a little bit of sense of there with the scale, um, but you'll get a little bit of a better sense after I give you a little bit more context. So if you're not familiar, the largest snakes that are alive today are the anaconda, specifically the, yellow, or the green anaconda, um, which uh, lives in North and South America today. That is the biggest on mass, so it is the biggest, heaviest snake alive today, but the reticulated python can actually get longer, even though it's not as bulky and massive, right? So, um, and it just depends on, on how you want to classify what's the biggest snake alive. Um, um, now this is two scale, so what we've got in the lower left is an anaconda vertebra. This is from a 19 foot female. This is about as big as they get. And that is the vertebra from the Serifone coal mine. And this is just one vertebra. This is actually not even the largest one that we've recovered. This is actually kind of one of the, the earlier ones that we found that was nice and, and three-dimensionally preserved and not squished. Um, so this gives you a little bit of sense of scale. It's really, really big, right? Um, and as it turns out, there's a whole ton of 
work and math and time that goes into uh, just, it's really big to actually figure out exactly how big that snake was. Um, again, I'll boil down uh, about a year's worth of work uh, into a single slide here. Basically, um, using what we call shape analysis, uh, we were able to take points of all the different vertebrae of the fossil snake that we found, um, as well as go across the entire vertebral column of a lot of relatives of the snake. Now, from the, the features of the bones, we knew it was in the family with boas and anacondas. That helped narrow the down a lot. But there's still quite a lot of members of the family. And in order to figure out how big it is, you really need to know where in the spinal column those vertebrae came from, because that has a huge difference in how big the whole snake ends up being, right? So by using the shape analysis, we can connect this point matches this point matches this point from the head to the tail of modern snakes and a wide variety of the family Boidae. And then uh, with a fancy algorithm, we can then uh, use some predictability to then put those within uh, about a 5% range within the spinal column of uh, the snakes. That gives us a sense then of how big the entire was. Um, so it's a whole big long process. Um, thanks to uh, the help of a bunch of um, co-authors, uh, we were able to figure out uh, that we were, uh, of course, indeed dealing with a very big snake. Uh, one that was about, about the size, actually a little bigger than your average school bus. Um, so we're looking at about 43 feet or 13 meters in length, which is absolutely insane. <laughs> much, much bigger than any anaconda alive today, and much bigger even than pythons. And as a, a close relative of the bows and anacondas, we expect a lot of that same kind of muscle mass built up around it. So this is something that would have been so, so incredibly powerful that, um, you know, to, to crunch through bones would be like, like holding a dry leaf in your hand. Take zero whatsoever to, you know, snap a, a skeleton of pretty much anything. Um, and in, in terms of, like, general proportions, it'd be kind of like having the weight of the Brooklyn Bridge on top of you. Like, your body at that point is inconsequential. Um, yeah, so we're looking at uh, about one and a quarter tons of mass, which is just insane for a snake. Um, and just a monster in, in every single respect. Um, every every reason to think this would have been an apex predator, there's nothing bigger than it in, in environment, um, especially in terms of length. And in terms of length, um, I'm still pretty darn sure it's the, the largest known animal on Earth at the time. Because um, this is after the age of the dinosaurs, so all the marine reptiles have gone extinct. Um, whales, whales don't exist yet. Um, and there's kind of the, we're still after the mass extinction event, so large sharks and, and fish aren't really a, a thing at this point that I'm aware of. Um, so in any case, it definitely is the biggest thing in its environment, and um, probably would have been able to eat, unfortunately for my favorites, the crocodilians, um, some of those would have been good food sources as well as some of the fish there. Um, now, in terms of like the bigger question though, we wanted to answer just how did this snake get so big, right? Why, why did this snake exist at this time and, and we don't know of any other giants this big any other time, right? Um, so the idea is, um, well, our idea was to go back to snake physiology, the basics of what makes a reptile a reptile, right? So looking at um, climate aspects and see if that is in, like we see in the modern record where we have um, snakes of a bigger size and warmer places. Now we already know it's the tropics, right? So we expect it to have been warm, but we don't have snakes that big today. So was it significantly hotter at the time? Now we traditionally do this a lot with plants and we do have a really good uh, fossil leaf record from this site. That's actually how uh, a lot of the, the great accuracy around the flora that you're standing in right now came from uh, direct fossil evidence. But I'll let you get a little bit. Um, so we knew it was pretty hot at the time, even uh, probably hotter than today. But uh, in order to kind of push into new territory, um, we developed what we uh, sort of 
uh, informally called the snake paleothermometer. Basically, looking at the physiology of snakes, um, which can actually be boiled down to a mathematical relationship that can tell us um, rough within um, kind of certain air bars how hot it would have been just to keep this snake. The short end is somewhere around maybe four-ish degrees Celsius, uh, mean annual temperature warmer than it is today. Now, four degrees might not sound like a lot. You can get more variation than that within a single day. Um, but when we're talking mean annual temperature, that's actually an enormous difference. Um, and just for a frame of reference for a lot of the climate change that we're looking at right now, that um, we're you know trying very much to, to stem the, the tide of, of the increase here and in, in already very much feeling the effects of climate change now, um, we are just trying to keep it to one and a half degree uh, Celsius temperature increase. Uh, going to four degrees is just completely new territory. And um, this was, especially when we published it, there's this concept that it's, um, that the tropics might actually be relatively buffered from future climate change, like within our human time, and that uh, the effects of climate change would be much more dramatic in other parts of the world. This um, really helped illustrate very vividly that um, the tropics has, has in the past been very hot, even significantly hotter than it is today, and it has every potential to do that again. And it's gonna have dramatic impact on the kinds of animals that do well in that environment. I think it's because of this lesson that Titanoboa is, can actually really contribute to our understanding of the world and how we prepare for the future. Um, so things like uh, past temperatures really help a lot actually in refining climate predictions for the future. Um, so you, the idea is you improve your, your track record in the past gives you a better chance to kind of project forward. And these kinds of important data, data points not only give us uh, really good data to then project for the tropics into the future, but also tell us, uh, give us some insight into what kinds of expectations we would have for life in these environments. Now there's of course lots of other factors that go into giant snakes existing, um, temperature being an important one, but not the only one. Um, so a lot of people like to bring up the question, I think I saw in the chat here, will we get uh, Titanoboa again, this massive giant snake? Um, I'll say that as as the temperature goes up, the bar of possibility also goes up and we can get larger and larger snakes. Um, the biggest other kind of thing that you got to keep in mind is that there has to be a, a good suitable habitat for those big snakes. And uh, one of the other things we're doing uh, very quickly in addition to raising the temperature is uh, destroying a lot of tropical habitats where these things would thrive. Um, so it's not not the best circumstances, but it's actually possible. And what we're seeing, um, what's a really good example of where this could go is uh, the invasive pythons in the Florida Everglades. And if you haven't run into the, uh, heard about these, um, they're often in the, the pet trade. Um, there are reticulated Burmese and rock pythons are all actually invasive in the southern part of Florida. It's really nice and warm and, and you know rarely gets very cold there. And uh, what we're starting to see is they're creeping further and further north. And uh, they're not small when they do that. Um, now, I'm not saying you know they're going to show up uh, like where I am here in Minnesota anytime soon, but uh, they're, <coughs> they're testing the, their boundaries. <coughs> they're, they're getting into places where they weren't before. Um, and that's being made possible in large part because of climate change. Um, and we're, Starting to see things like alligator Virginia, like these things um, just within my lifetime have been changing, which is incredible. Um, so, <laughs> on that very positive note for our future, I think it's exciting um, in the sense that I love giant reptiles and I would love to see a one and a quarter ton snake uh, slithering around. Most people don't feel, like, feel the same way, um, but that's okay. Um, and uh, I, I think the other big cautionary tale that I like to throw out there is that um, not only is this going to affect reptiles, but this also affects other things that we um, often term as 
quote unquote cold blooded. Um, and that actually includes um, insects and arachnids as well. Um, and that means that uh, not only are kind of snakes going to be able to get to places that they couldn't before and get bigger where they were before, um, things like mosquitoes are also going to do well in different environments. And the diseases that they carry are also going to spread. These are very real consequences of climate change driven by life, driven by um, how that climate affects the life on Earth. And I think the more we can learn about what's happened in the past, the better prepared we can be. That's my soapbox, um, and I will say thank you, and I will pass the reins over to Greg, who spent a lot of time making this very lovely model. Um, so thank you very much, and I encourage you to pass your attention to Greg, and he does have some slides here as well for you guys. So thanks, Greg. I will let you take over. Thanks, Alex. So I'll restart with the caveat. When when Chantel asked me to do this, I had some experience with 3D modeling. I found some. I had a lot of time on my hands, so starting about a year ago. And so I got involved in 3D modeling and texturing, uh, but I hadn't done any rigging or animation. And so, you know, I made a lot of mistakes in this, and and. Uh, so any comments, suggestions people have uh, after who might be more experienced are welcome, of course. So when I do, oh, when I do talks, usually about people can take away about three things, and so I like to point them out in the beginning uh, explicitly, and we'll get back to these. Uh, as we go through the, the talk, but it's making the maps, no images. And we'll talk a little bit about the default uh, SL skeleton. The first two are just, just amazed me and what kind of brought me into texturing and 3D modeling. And uh, the last is probably the most uh, annoying of the, of the things that I went through to make this happen. We'll kind of go over this workflow uh, this will be a workflow mostly for what's called game engines or, or multi-user uh, distributed real-time interactive environments, uh, also known as games. But uh, it's a very different workflow than, than you would find for uh, animation in a, in a motion picture or even an animated short. We'll talk about how to create the mesh and, and why we need low and high poly versions of the mesh, what UV maps are, talk about the creation of the textures, uh, and that they're procedural, which is, you know, to me, one of the most fascinating things about this whole process, and, and rigging, and which is basically building a skeleton for, for the animal or the, and the mesh, and then animating it. So here's the workflow that I put together, starting off on the left uh, with, with the idea. And again, thanks to Chantel for, for uh, thinking of me and, and asking me to do this, even though it was definitely a challenge and, and uh, pushed my skills quite a bit. Uh, I created the mesh originally in Maya, which is a 3D modeling tool, and then created a low poly version and a high poly version in ZBrush. And I'll explain why you need those as we go along. But, but basically, you import the low poly version to the game engine and use the high poly version to create the maps that give you the detail. Uh, and because you don't want a high poly version in the environment, in the engine, it consumes too much resource. So the low poly version, you get the UV maps, and then you go into uh, a tool to bake the maps. In this case, I use Substance Painter. Create the textures in another tool called Substance Designer. 
and then back and bring those and the maps into a subsequent painter and create the materials, which are the texturing you see on the snake. Then you rig it back at Tamaya, the low poly version. Uh, you create skin weights for it, which identifies uh, how, how the skin moves with which bones or which joints, and then you animate those joints. So this is the low poly version, and it has uh, about 26,000 polygons, and that's the tongue sticking out in, in front there. I used that. I put it out there just so I could get a better handle on it when I assign the skin weight. This is a close up uh, of the low poly version. You can see that uh, the polygons are fairly good size, but it's still pretty smooth smooth surface and it was some definition but but not very much next we'll take a look this is the high poly version it, I created in ZBrush and here we have 12 million polygons most of which are are in the in the head scales and the teeth uh, because that's that's where I needed the definition and at one point in the process I had uh, created the procedural scales, which I'll show you in a minute. And those were all over the head, and Alex pointed out that the head scales were slightly different. So I had to figure out how to create head scales, and, and uh, doing that procedurally was pretty difficult, and I didn't see a way through, so I, I went back into the high poly mesh and created each of the uh, individual head scales and the individual teeth one by one in ZBrush on the high poly version of this snake. So the UV maps, uh, UV stands, doesn't stand for ultraviolet. When I first started this, I kept thinking that that's uh, that's what it was, but it turns out it's not. Uh, it's it's the it's the two axes in in this uh, two dimensional plane here, uh, V being up vertical and, and U being uh, horizontal. And they use U V because X Y and Z were taken for three dimensional. W is important for some sort of rotation in 3D, and so U and V were left. And so you can just think of U, V as X, Y. That's all that means. And what you do is you, you sort of cut the low poly mesh up in uh, sort of organized fashion and uh, lay it out here in two dimensions. And this is what tells the engine how to take a two-dimensional texture that you create and wrap it around the three-dimensional object. This is uh, also known as a projection. And if you can think of some of the projections of uh, the Earth or of a globe, uh, some of the different maps we use, uh, this is the same kind of thing. We're trying to represent a 3D object in two dimensions. And you can see I've laid this out uh, in a pretty regular fashion. Uh, I, I split them with sort of head to tail on the ventral and dorsal line, and uh, then transversely. It turns out that the way that I, I map this, each of these tiles, these are called UV tiles, each one of them. It turns out that they're about, they cover about one meter square. Uh, in in second life when you look at the snake and of course that's a million square millimeters which will be important later when when we talk about the resolution that I would have wanted to achieve uh, uh, on on the snake uh, you can see that the uh, oh 
this is, let me see if I can get a little closer here. So this is the mouth. Uh, these are the eyes over here. And this is the tongue. Of course, this is the left and right sides of the head. Pretty obvious what the what the head is. Okay, baking the mouth. So again, uh, we need to we need to have a high poly version to get the detail, like those head scales and the teeth. But there's no way that we could uh, bring twelve uh, an object of twelve million polygons into Second Life. I mean, you can't even upload something that size. But we want that detail. And so the maps are a way of sort of telling the rendering engine uh, what to do with each pixel uh, when it renders it, how to, how to make it look. And so there's a lot of information coded in the maps uh, with, in, and basically in either color or grayscale versions. And there are typically six characteristics that we look at. And so you create these maps in Substance Painter with six uh, characteristics for each UV tile. Again, there's two purposes. There's the illusion of height in the final texture, but also provides guidance for creating the materials uh, in, in Substance Painter. So we'll take a look at each one of these, uh, how they look. Uh, the normal is uh, the normal map is really important. It basically says for every pixel, what is its normal relative to the normal to the surface of the low poly version at that point. And then it, it does a dot product of those two vectors and turns that into a color, and that's what you see on the on the texture. World space normal is pretty straightforward. It's a color gradient from top to bottom. Ambient occlusion is, is how the parts sort of shadow one another. And it's very important for in the texturing process to, uh, to create shadows where they, where they should be. Curvature and thickness are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, they're grayscale and they, they uh, the curvature shows areas of high and low curvature and the thickness uh, differentiates between thick and thin. Position is like world space, but front to back. So it's a color gradient from front to back of the object. So here's the normal map. Uh, you can see that that's typically the color you see. You can clearly see the head scales outlined and you can see, if I can get this laser pointer to where, you can see like right up here. Maybe I'm not standing close enough. There we go. You can see right up in there that that's, that's definitely a different color because that's almost vertical. Uh, with respect to the normal of the surface of the low poly version at that point. Uh, back over here, you see the head scale, the, the um, body scales, which are the procedural ones. Next, you have the world space uh, normal, which is just again the color gradient from top to bottom. Ambient occlusion, clearly. You know, between the scales, there's going to be shadows because it's a small area, and we use this to create uh, dust and things in between in, in the crevices. Curvature areas of high curvature are, are darker, and low curvature are, are lighter. Thickness darker areas are thick, uh, lighter areas are thinner. And I use this uh, quite a bit in, in creating masks to, to just apply color and uh, variations to the head scales and not to the, to the rest of the body. And this is position, just uh, 
color gradient from front to back. World Space Normal you use if you want to create drifts or leaks or things that follow the uh, gravity vector. And here you can do variations from the front to back uh, in a smooth way by following the gradient. Okay, this is uh, the second thing that I thought uh, was, was really interesting is that there's no images uh, used today uh, for, for texturing these objects. A lot, of, a lot of things you see in Second Life are done that way. Uh, they've used Photoshop and create images and apply those to the UV maps. And that's, that's perfectly fine. And it's a very low uh, resource, uh, has a very low resource demand. But here, uh, because we're, we're doing this functionally, we can change things and modify them and use them in different ways. So a lot of the work that I uh, redid or I uh, have done on this can be used for other, uh, other objects as well. And so you start with something like a circle, equation of a circle, and then you apply transforms until you get a snake scale uh, in the end. And uh, so, so just another caveat, uh, you know, I did not create this whole graph myself, but I downloaded this from one of the sharing websites. I did modify it quite a bit uh, with help from Alex to produce the, the shape and the orientation and the size of the scales that he said uh, would probably have been on Patanaboa. So you start at the left with a circle and then you apply various transforms and get a different shape. And here you can see uh, down in the lower right, you can see a, a gradient, a uh, left to right gradient, and then a top to bottom uh, gradient here applied. And you end up with something, it's hard to see, but on the bottom you can see that what the result is uh, there's a oval shape and you get a grayscale gradient top to bottom which shows it to be sort of rounded in that direction and you can also use it for height information so the right hand side is a little bit lower or farther away from the camera than the left hand side but the output from from substance designer in this particular case are uh, four maps. This is a normal map for those uh, body scales. Uh, the, we've talked about that. The ambient occlusion we talked about. Height uh, gives you a little bit more, gives the normal map a little bit more information on uh, how high or how far away from the low poly version a particular artifact might be. And the roughness is very important. The roughness is, uh, is on a scale from zero to one, and, and zero roughness means extremely shiny, and, and one, of course, means uh, something that's very rough and, and doesn't reflect light uh, at, at all except in a diffuse way. And I use this quite a bit to get the, get the shine on, on uh, the snake. So this I just brought up because this is completely done in Substance Designer. There's no mesh, it's all procedural, there's no image, and uh, this sort of technique is used, being used for product advertisements today. So a lot of the advertisements you see for artifacts or things uh, people want to advertise are just created in this, in this sort of uh, mathematical way rather than, it's a lot, in the end, it's a lot easier and less expensive than uh, trying to photograph something in real life and get the lighting ready. Okay, then we're back into Substance Painter and we want to create the materials. And so here you see how uh, the head of forest looks uh, with, with nothing but the normal map sort of applied to the head scale. And uh, down on the right, you can see that this is the normal map from the baking. Then I used the, the thickness to create a mass to apply this color only to these scales. And pretty much did the same and applied some sort of gunk to the edges. And this is done by a, uh, a 
function called the generator that sort of looks at the curvature map and, and the thickness map and tries to create uh, random uh, noisy images around the edges of whatever it is, whatever object uh, that you're trying to make. And there's, there's many different kinds of generators that you can use uh, to create different patterns and according to, to the maps in some way. Then I added, uh, use the sort of the inverse of that mask to put a different color in the spaces between the head scales. And then finally use that, uh, the roughness map to add some shininess in the right places uh, for uh, what we thought would be the, the shininess uh, of the snake. So output from Substance Painter are three texture files for each uh, tile. And uh, these are the only three that, that Second Life has available uh, to apply to a face of a crim. On the left is the color, there's the normal, and the shininess. So 28 tiles I had, um, 13 for each half, uh, about a meter long, and then, um, so totally there's 84 1K by 1K texture files that make up the, the texture of, of Boris. And those are about 173, uh, megabytes in size all together. 1K by 1K is, is all that is the max that uh, Second Life allows. And we're back to this slide and you can see now that uh, since we have a 1K by 1K uh, texture and the texture is laid on one of these tiles, we're getting about one pixel per square millimeter of surface. So as you look at, at Boris here, about every square millimeter has its own set of information from those three maps telling the rendering engine how to, how to display that pixel. Rigging is, uh, is the process of creating a skeleton uh, for the, the object. And uh, the only thing, the only object really there is it, are the joints and then the bones just go between the joints when uh, you, you create a hierarchical relationship between them. Then you create what's called the inverse kinematics for the set of joints to make it easy to pose and then some controllers. And then you do the skin weighting, uh, which is probably one of the most important uh, things in getting smooth motion and that's each vertex of the mesh is influenced by, in Second Life, up to four joints. And the influence says, as this joint moves, uh, where should I move this vertex? And every time that, uh, every 30 times a second, your viewer has to, you know, do that computation for every vertex and every object on your screen. So when I, First uh, animated, I built a skeleton of 60, 60 joints from head to tail and animated it in Maya, and, and it looked, looked great. I thought, wow, this is easy. And then I learned that every animesh and AB in Second Life has to have this default skeleton. You can't have a custom skeleton. So this is sort of a, a pretty annoying thing. There's a lot of discussion about it on the forums. The joints have to have the same name and the orientation has to be the same and the hierarchy has to be the same. But you can translate the joints in three space uh, and uh, except that no joint is it's allowed to be more than some number of meters away from its uh, assumed position in the default skeleton. So I ended up with uh, modifying that default skeleton to look like this. And you can see that the circles are the joints and the triangles are the bones, and they point uh, parents to child. Uh, on the left, where you see the, I can't get that laser pointer to go. On the left and the bottom, which is just a blow up of the, of the central skeleton, uh, it's the pelvis, and that's sort of the pelvis is the root of everything. And so I just laid all these out straight, and 
Uh, over on the right hand side, you can see a couple joints that I use to open and close the mouth, and then the three in green are for the tongue. But you can't animate this because of the parent-child relationship. Everything's messed up, and so there's no way to make a smooth motion. So I had to build a control skeleton on top of it, which had parent-child relationship from top to bottom. And then I could animate that uh, pretty easily. So this is what the skin weights look like, a uh, representation of the uh, influence of each of those uh, 60 joints on the vertices around uh, the mesh of, of the snake. And you can see the upper part of the head is, uh, is all one color as is the lower part of the head because they, they go in, in one, uh, they move in one, uh, with one joint. Okay, the last slide is the animation. And uh, so basically you, you take that control skeleton with the mesh with the weights and you position the joints in some sort of location. You can rotate them and translate them. And then, then you bind that to a particular time on a timeline. You change the pose in some way, and then you bind that to a time on the timeline. And the, the engine interpolates between those two. And so the smooth motion between these two is done by the engine. Uh, and you have a lot of control over this. You can actually look at the graph of these uh, individual joints and how they change from key to key, and you can you can modify that graph. You can have a you know have a spline coming from one key, curving gently into the next key, or you can have linear. You can do all kinds of things with uh, with that interpolation between the two keys. The undulations you see in the snake are just from attaching a sine wave curve to that animation skeleton and then keying the offset. So the sine wave is basically moving through uh, the snake. One of the limitations in SL is, is that you can't animate a joint farther than 10 meters from its initial position. And I understand why, uh, and we can talk about that uh, later, maybe at the fireside chat. So, for Boris, the motion over the ground is, uh, is, is done by another server-side call uh, to, to move the position. And so you have to sort of uh, coordinate those two motions. So next, uh, that's my last slide. And uh, Celia is going to talk about the, the sort of amazing job she's done. And the site that it really feels great. Okay, thank you. Well, I am just so impressed with what you have done, Greg. I mean, just, it's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And I followed the whole process, and I am still just blown away. So, uh, it's been an honor to be part of this. And i got to say, this has been one of the more interesting projects and habitat builds I have done in Second Life, and I've done a lot of them. So Greg was talking about signs. Um, I had to work with an entirely different set of signs and signals. And it was really like being a, a detective. So the habitats that I have done previously in Seven Life are uh, modeled on actual habitats in real life. Um, so you can, actually, you can look those things up and find some of the things. But here, that isn't the case. What we have here is fossils. So the challenge was to go from rocks to ecosystem. Ah, so where did it start? Sorry, wrong direction. 
where are we? What world are we on? So we need to change the earth, but boy, we time travel. And take a minute and look at this. This is uh, an estimation of a few million years later in history than uh, the time that we, of the fossils of Boris, so whether we still had the uh, Boris around at this time, not sure, likely. Take a look at it, and what do you see, what do you notice um, that's different here than um, a projected map of Earth today? Really, I'm going to ask a lot of questions here because this really was a, a detecting project. Is there anything that you notice here that sticks out particularly um, that is different than today's planet? Yeah, India isn't attached to the rest of what would become Asia. Yeah, so now that continents are close together. Yes, much closer. So that, that's a key sign, a key hint here that we've got to remember. So it wasn't that long ago in terms of um, geologic time that what is now South America and what is now Africa uh, pulled away from each other. What else do you notice in the, the general northern South American area? Yeah, Australia has, has this time just uh, recently pulled away from Antarctica. Yeah, so we, we actually don't know whether uh, the rotation was not as good today, uh, uh, not the same then. But. So in this world, here is where we are. This platform is representing that little tiny um, area on the northern part of what is now South America and that little peninsula, the Saran Mai is in a, a basin here and it, it happens to be one of the largest um, open air coal mines in the world. It is not anthracite, it's bituminous coal. So that came from the lignite to uh, bitumen. That's another key piece here. Um, but look also at the, the oceans and the sea there. Where's Panama? Yeah, the, the sea is higher. Um, at this time, the estimate is about 40 meters higher than today, and there's no ice. Another key piece here, no ice anywhere on the globe. So we, we do not have uh, the connection here. There is no Panama. Um, the Andes are not fully formed. So the Andes, they, they're having trouble um, getting a really good fix on the, the age and sequence of the uprisings of the Andes. But roughly 90 million years of time, so starting back in the the uh, Cretaceous and you're, you're going forward here, but they're not fully formed yet for another, oh, 20 million years or so beyond the time that we're working with. 
So the mountains are going to affect the weather as well. So Alex mentioned that they think it's going, it was probably four degrees average, nearly average temperature higher. Um, how is that playing out? Because the, the weather is a key part here. You can't have a rainforest, jungle uh, habitat without paying attention to what the weather was. So if you have an area that is a, a coastal plain um, and it at various times was riverine or just a coastal plain, they think, in this area, you're going to have um, no mountains and no um, Isthmus of Panama to catch some of the weather coming from the west. So you're going to have uh, a very, very different weather pattern. And if you have a much higher temperature and you're in a, a water habitat, you're going to have a lot of evaporation. So one of the things here that you'll notice that we have here is um, a lot of mist because we have a lot of evaporation. So keep all of these things in mind and look at the fossils for a minute. So if you look at uh, a lot of fossils over time, you'll see that the rocks that they're embedded in don't all look the same. Um, these rocks are re relatively smooth. So what else does that tell you about the, the habitat at the time? So if you have the, the um, siltstone, the, the mud, you don't have very turbulent water, or you wouldn't have things laid down in this way. So here's another clue then of the kind of habitat to build here. Yeah, that uh, that, that there are um, the conjunction of a handful of plates there. You have the Nazca plate, you have the uh, Diana plate. Um, yes, you have a, a number of plates that uh, converge right there. So there are lots and lots of plant fossils, but they are leaves and they are pollens. So taking a look at those, we're able to discern the kinds of plants, the kinds of families of plants that uh, existed, that comprise this particular habitat. So from the fossils, there were a number of coconut palms. There was some salvinia. So then you have the, the duckweeds and the water ferns and the water moss. Um, you have some bean family. The flamboyant tree is a bean family. The mimosa is a bean family. There were probably uh, various vines that look similar to vetch. Um, you have a whole range of other palms. You still have ferns. Um, magnolias were beginning, and the alligator apple and the magnolia are related. Then you also have the bananas coming forth and banana and red ginger are related. Uh, the conifer fossils are, are hard to tell exactly what it was, so I took a guess and uh, put in cypress because most of the conifers today don't live in this kind of a very hot environment that the cypr cypress does. Um, 
moon seeds were all over the place, everywhere. Now, moon seeds are, are poisonous for humans, but they are not poisonous for a lot of animals, and they um, are prevalent in the fossils here. You have amaryllis. You have, so you have some flowers coming. You have the bean family flowers. You have the amaryllis. You have mallow flowers. So I decided to put hibiscus because that is the other, uh, another thing that would live in this kind of a vi environment that um, is in the mallow family. And then the beginning of mangroves. Now, they, there's something else here uh, that you see in the fossils that um, you might not notice right away in the leaves, and uh, there are holes. There are holes that have been chewed. So, although there aren't insect fossils, there's evident signs of insects having lived here um, and chewed the holes in the plant, in the leaves. So, but they are, from the, the size, shape, of condition of the holes, it's estimated that these are generalist insect eaters, not, um, not specific, not ones that have um, specialized in particular plants. Well, Shiloh, since there aren't insect fossils here, we don't know. We can guess that there were bigger insects. Now, um, because they lived in this kind of environment and there are fossil records from other places, I put out dragonflies. Uh, because it's likely there were dragonflies. Were there mosquitoes? Mm, dragonflies eat mosquitoes today. Uh, maybe there were mosquitoes, but we don't know that. Uh, my daughter, who has spent time in the Amazon, says that in the um, Peruvian Amazon, there are enormous, voracious mosquitoes. But uh, in the mouth of the Amazon, she said she didn't, she wasn't really bothered by mosquitoes. So was it the same then? Who knows? We just have to guess. Um, but we know that there would have been the beginnings of these kinds of insects because we have the, the, the chew marks left. So, if that's what we have for the fossil record, what's missing? What do we need to fill in here? I mean, we have the, some of the animal bone records, so we have the, uh, the snakes, the crocodiles, the turtles, uh, and as Alex said, the lungfish, and also tarpon. We don't have either of those as representing re representation in Second Life. Um, so, because we know they were here, I've put ghost lungfish and ghost tarpon. Yeah, Dolly, that, that's an interesting uh, thing too from what I have read and uh, word may have more information than I do about this. There was a higher content of, uh, of CO2. I mean, this was a, because of the Andes um, fits and starts. There certainly would have been volcanic activity. Um, and so the guess is that there was more more of the, the CO2, but we, um, and we don't know the O2. Um, but what we can also guess here from the fact that you have the lungfish and you have the, the tarpon here, is that there was probably, the water was probably low oxygen. And why do I say that? Because both of those species um, can rise to the surface and um, take oxygen from the air. 
And so if you have a murky water that is slow moving because you don't have the turbulence in the rocks, um, you have the muddy rocks, and you have, yeah, so the water would tend to be somewhat stagnant, most likely. And you have the lungfish that can come out of the, the water and breathe air, and you have the, um, the tarpon that also can rise to the surface and fill their, their air bladders with oxygen from the air. It's likely that this was, yeah, a, um, a swamp of that kind, yes. So if you look around, um, what else is missing here that you would find in today's swamp? No, no, no mushrooms, no, no lichen or moss. <laughs> possums, yeah, right? <laughs> I don't know if there are possums there. But uh, to go back to what Vic was asking or talking about earlier, uh, there's almost no grass. Grass was just beginning. So that you have um, generalist insects, you have families of plants that are coming along that have replaced some of the uh, swamp plants of the, the previous era. No birds. No fossil birds. That's right. No fossil birds. So, uh, you have, uh, back to the grass for a minute, the, you would have grasses along the sides today uh, in this kind of environment. No grass. Almost no grass. Um, and the, since the insects were, the evidence for insects were generalist, they're assuming that the plants and the beginning flowers uh, were not pollinated by insects or birds, but they were probably wind pollinated. So that gives you another clue to the environment. So all of this is putting together an entire system from these little clues. We know we have to have prey because we have predators. And if you have predators, it's going to take at least three to one biomass, and sometimes more than that, to, to support a predator. Um, there's more than one snake, there's more than one turtle. In fact, there are a lot of snakes and turtles and uh, uh, fossils of various sizes here. So there have got to be somewhere uh, fish and other small animals uh, that are inhabiting this area as well. Even though we don't have the, the solid evidence for them. So bringing it all together uh, was little by little. It was putting things from this all of the things that I've said, plus a whole lot more, and to figure out what are the uh, systemic properties of this habitat. So that if you have the beginnings of the mangroves, for instance, you're going to have um, the water plants caught in, in the roots of the mangroves, you're going to have um, the a lot of, because the the coal mine is so big and there's so much mass of material there, you, you, in order to get that there had to be a lot of plant material as well. So um, you're going to have the dying plants caught in some of the coastal, the edge areas, and particularly in some of the mangrove uh, uh, roots, and you're going, that's what's going to build the land here. So you're going to have the process, that slow process of building land and slowing down the, the river, slowing down the water, 
when you have that and you have this built up little by little, you have muck like we're standing in. So you have slime and muck and algae and uh, all of that sort of thing. The, the alligator apple is also going to be building some of the land. Um, there are uh, fossils of the coconut, the actual coconuts. So we have coconuts falling from the trees here and um, settling on, on the bottom of the river. But take a minute now and walk around and look at everything. Look at how things are pulled together um, and why, think about why they might have been done in this way. Uh, they could have been done differently, but uh, to make an entire ecosystem out of uh, fossil rocks. Do take your landmark. This is a jungle area. You could get somewhere oh. caught in the, 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 the vines, the mucky surface. Um, but do walk around and then report back here. Tell us what you're finding. We have this, um, we have the voice enabled and the chat enabled throughout now. So even if you're further away, you're going to be able to talk with us. Yeah, yeah, roll call. We're going to see if anyone's missing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know, uh, on, that there were no birds. We just know that there aren't any bird fossils. Um, so, some people are guessing that there might have been birds like mouse birds that are found in this kind of environment, other places in the world, and there are uh, mouse bird fossils found um, in other locations. <laughs> oh, I'm glad Boris has eaten recently, and I would have been in big trouble there. No pigeons. Nope. No pigeons. One of the more other interesting things is that, although it wasn't found here, you know, for birds, there was at that time a tropical penguin that might have been in this area. Uh, it's possible. And another critter that I put in, you might see, is a, um, a catfish. Because although there's no catfish fossil here, within this same watershed area and within the same um, time frame, there were catfish that looked very, with the rounded head, very much like the ones that you'll, you'll see here. So, yeah, yeah, the catfish fossil, yeah, just a little further south. That's why I put that, uh, Alex, that's why I put catfish in here. Yeah, that's what I found in doing the, the research there. Yeah. So it's likely you would have had that as well. Yeah, it, it may have snacked on a crocodile. It certainly would have snacked on a lungfish. But you think about a snake this large, how many Lungfish, and how often would you, would they have to, I mean, how many lungfish would have to be in this area to uh, support a snake? Um, um, so I can jump in on this one. Um, so, <clears throat> pretty low metabolism, this is part of how they're able to be so successful. So something like a titanoboa, get like a really good meal in it, like a really, really big lungfish or like a, a decent sized crocodile, um, could have even been good for like an entire year. Um, so it's not like you actually need a huge, um, you know, food source in order to sustain these things. 
Um, they could actually get by on, on much, much less than a warm-blooded animal would eat. Oh, that's good. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, one more little piece here uh, as you're walking along, because you can walk some of the places. You can walk underwater. You can walk on the edges of the, the uh, rivers here. Um, you're going to find that there is rain in, in the hills because you're going to have that kind of evaporation and that kind of heat um, with the cooling off at night. You're going to have some rain. So, um, and oh, they're estimating that the annual rainfall was probably in the vicinity of 140, maybe as high as 160 inches a year. Now, in the Amazon today, the uh, annual rain um, is 108 inches. So it was a lot more rainy then than it is now. Yeah, so as you're looking around, uh, and you, one of the ways that things are grouped here, if they're saying that the, the pollination was likely by wind, that's going to be produce a different kind of uh, clumping of, of plants than if it were pollinated by insects, and particularly if it were pollinated by birds, you have a lot more dispersal than, than you would if you have it by wind. Um, and, oh, I didn't get back to what you were saying, Vic, about the uh, species divergence. Um, I started on that, but so, so as a for instance, uh, in the previous epics, there were this kind of area would have uh, cycads, there are no cycads here, they're gone. Um, and the, there's more of the uh, amount of some of these than there is the diversity of, say, the, the bean family. So you don't have a lot of diversity yet. It's just beginning to um, diversify little by little. Um, so you have a handful of species, but not a lot of diversity within those species at this period of time, so far as they have found so far. Comments, questions uh, for any of us. here. Bring your students here. Yeah, I'm sure that any of us or all of us would be more than pleased to come and join you and um, answer questions at any time.
We really did need all three of us to do this. No one of us could have done this alone. Yeah, explore, um, bring your questions to the fireside chat on Monday, um, and anything else that you think of along the way. really was an exciting project to work on. And we can also talk more on Monday about what we can learn from this regarding um, future climate change, like uh, Alex was mentioning. 